Hello kids, it's the Trailer Reader here with another episode of your 10-minute literary review. Today we'll be examining Life of Pi. Now, I know what you're thinking. A 10-minute review? <laughs> Not likely. I know, I know, the first two episodes went a little long. My wife says I have a tendency to talk too much, but I can't help it. I love talking about great books. So, today, in the spirit of, and dare I say it, the letter of a 10-minute conversation on books, here it is, your 10-minute literary view of Life of Pi. Okay, let's start with the novel basics. Number one, this story was written in 2001 by Jan Martel. Number two, it has two basic perspectives in this story. The first is of that of an anonymous author who is in India trying to find some inspiration for a book because his first two books have flopped, and he goes into a cafe and he ends up finding a man who tells him this intriguing story about a young boy who survives being stranded on a life raft in the Pacific Ocean with a Bengal tiger. What? <laughs> I know, right? Crazy. So the story so intrigues him that he decides to go to Canada to find this boy, who is now a man, uh, and, and find out and interview him to find out more about the story. Now, the second principal character is that of the boy himself, Pasini Molitar Patel, or as he prefers to be called, Pi. Number three of the novel basics is that this story has three parts to it. The first part covers the life of Pi before his father decides to sell their family zoo and move them and most of their animals to Canada. That's right. I said it. He lives in a zoo. Now, my family is kind of crazy, but I'm not sure it's exactly zoo material. But I, I think maybe yours might be. Yeah? No? <laughs> Don't hurt me. Now, part two covers the sinking of the cargo ship that carries Pi and his family across the Pacific Ocean to Canada and also most of their animals. Now, there are only five survivors of this wreck over the Marianas Trench, and that is, of course, Pi himself. Number two is a hyena. Number three is a zebra. Number four is an orangutan named Orange Juice. And number five, a Bengal tiger named Richard Parker. Who comes up with these names anyway? Uh, actually, the book tells you. I'm not going to. You're going to have to figure that one out for yourself. Anyway, the animals there on the life raft don't survive very long, and soon it is just Pi and Richard Parker drifting aimlessly across the Pacific. Now, as I said before, there are two perspectives in this book, that of the anonymous author and that of Pi Patel. And as the course of the book progresses, the point of view shifts back and forth, depending on the author's point or trying to transition into a new topic. But since I've already gave you the basic plot in the previous section, I think the best way of going on forward now is to discuss the parts separately in a little bit more detail to draw out more from it. So here we go. Okay, so in the first part, we've already discussed how Pi and his family own a zoo, and he lives there, which is crazy. But it's also really intensely fun and interesting, and Pi learns very important things that become significant to the book. One of them is about how animals, wild animals, and humans can cohabit the same place without killing each other. There's one really critical lesson that happens at this time, and his dad, Pi's dad, takes him and his brother Ravi to the Bengal tiger, Richard Parker. And then they're like, oh, I love Richard Parker, he's so great. And then the dad's like, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah? Watch this. And then he feeds the tiger a live goat. And when the tiger proceeds to tear it apart, blood and screams, and it's pretty grisly. Actually, I think that would have been a great parenting moment for him, uh, for Pi's dad. He just go over there, okay, son. Now you see what that tiger did to that goat? <laughs> you want to piss me off? Do you really? Hmm? No, 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 no. That's bad parenting. But it's kind of a fun idea. So that scene is very, very important because it discusses the inner nature of human beings, not just wild animals, but inside human beings, there's also wild animals. And that's a very important part to one of the major themes in this book. Okay. The next important thing from part one of the book that we should take away is the origin of Pi's name. Now, Pai's full name is Spasini Molitar Patel, which is an odd kind of name, but has an even odder origin, and that is this. His dad's business partner, who, by the way, is the man that the anonymous author talked to in that cafe, loves the pools of Paris, and his favorite pool in Paris is Spasini Molitar. Now, 
Why would Pi's dad choose to name him that? <laughs> I don't know. I have no clue, but man, he should be sued. Uh, this causes problems later for Pi. How come? Because kids are mean. And of course, the kids start making fun of him, and because his name is Piscini, it sounds like pissing, and they call him pissing. Well, Pi doesn't like this. So what does he do? He decides to use the training he received from his father to train animals on his students. That's right. The author here calls the classrooms zoos, and you students are the animals in the zoo. What a sad commentary on education. So what he does is he decides to go up, when Roll Call is done, when teachers start saying their names, he goes up there every single time, every single class, and writes down his name. My name is Pi, like the irrational number that goes on forever, that has no repeating patterns to it. I'm Pi, I'm Pi, get it? I'm Pi. Anyway, it works, and from then on, he's known as Pi. And the last thing from part one we need to take away is that Pi has a fascination with religions and stories in general. And he's you now brought up to be a Hindu, of course. But then he meets this, uh, this father from the Catholic Church who then tells him the story of Jesus. And so he decides to become a Christian as well as a Hindu. And the third religion is Islam. And there's this one funny story where the three representatives of the faiths that uh, Pi belongs to come together and discover, wait, you remember that faith? You remember that faith? You can't do that. You got to pick one. And Pi's like, no, I don't. I like all three. And he decides to keep it. This is important later on because there is a strong connection between religion and zoos, but more on that later. Now, part two of the book is where all the action takes place, all the plot, and it's pretty easy to follow. Uh, however, there are some important points that you need to pay attention to. And the first of these is the action sequence, or the series of events that immediately take place after Pi and the animals board the life vessel. But now Pi has a problem. There's a live tiger on this boat. So what does he do? He proceeds to tame the tiger using all the techniques that he's learned from his father in the zoo. Along this journey, there are several amazing and horrifying things that happen. Uh, like a huge storm that nearly kills them. A carnivorous floating island. What? <laughs> And a uh, cannibalistic crazy Frenchman after they lose all hope, which, by the way, is the second Frenchman to be not a nice guy in this book. The first is the French chef. You look it up, but come on, Yann Martel. Two bad Frenchmen? What are you saying about the French? Now, at first, the story appears over at the end of part two because they made it successfully ashore, right? Well, not exactly, because part three contains probably the most important point of all. Now, when the Japanese representatives of the cargo ship, the company that owns the cargo ship, come to, on a fact-finding mission to discover what happened to the ship, Pi begins to tell them an alternative story. But instead of animals making aboard the boat, we have a very handsome Chinese sailor with a broken leg. We have a really nasty, evil French chef. We have Pi's mom, and we have Pi himself. And in this version, Pi is both the tiger and Pi himself. At the end of this interview, Pi asks them, which version of the story do you prefer? And the Japanese representatives are like, yeah, yeah, we like the first version. Now, in order to discuss this story in more depth, it's important to distinguish the difference between plot and story. So, the plot is mostly about a boy and a tiger that try to survive on a life raft in the Pacific Ocean. But the story is much more than that. The story is really about how mankind needs stories, needs something to believe in, in order to keep what they've endured survivable. Which brings me to the second way of taking a look at this novel, and that is the importance or the relationship between zoos and religion. Now, what is a zoo? A zoo is a contained area for wild animals to keep them and humans from hurting each other. And religion, in a sense, is also a zoo. It's restrictions, it's rules, it's regulations, it's things that keep us from hurting one another and competing with another and killing each other over resources. Kind of see the correlation there. But religion is made up of a bunch of stories, and each story has something unique to offer, which is why he welcomes all stories, because he wants to be happy. Now, there's a certain amount of fiction involved in storytelling, and he acknowledges that with religions as well. 
Okay, and now it's time for the reading tips. Tip number one, find the symbols. This book is mostly allegory. As such, it's full of lots of events and characters that represent or stand for something else. Now here's a challenge for you. I want you to go to the book and look up the name of the cargo ship and find out what does that name even mean? It's an unusual name, but it has a very important significance to the overall meaning of the story. So I challenge you. Look. Number two, pay attention to all the talk about zoos and religion. As mentioned before, they're very critical to understanding the author's main point of the story. Number three, enjoy the ride. First, read the book through. Enjoy it. Find the pleasure in it because it's a really cool adventure story. Well, that's it. In ten minutes or less, as promised. Was I as funny? Was I as charming? Maybe not, but I gave you the information you needed to have. Anyway, I hope you found this video useful and added to your enjoyment of your reading of Life of Pi. Below are listed links to a bunch of other sites that can give you alternative information or insights in the book, should you choose to use them. And as usual, if you have a question about the book you'd like to ask me, or you have a recommendation for a book you'd like me to cover in a future episode, please list them in the comments section below. And don't forget to subscribe. <laughs> Keep reading, kids. This is the Trailer Reader, signing off. Hey, babe. What would you prepare if you could go on an ocean voyage like Pi? Um, uh, marrying a fisherman? Okay.